This is FRM part one, book three, financial markets and products and the chapter on corporate bonds. Let's look at this slide deck from two perspectives. Initially from the issuing corporation, which needs capital, typically huge amounts of capital that it's going to ask to borrow from bondholders throughout the world. They need that capital pretty quickly because they have decided that they need this capital to invest in wealth increasing projects. Second perspective is from the regular old investor. Now, whether that investor is someone like you or me, an individual investor or an institutional investor, like maybe a pension fund or a mutual fund or an endowment fund, we'll look at this throughout this slide deck from both of those perspectives. And you'll see that as we go through these learning objectives. So notice the action words, lots of describes and defines. We'll start by talking about bond trading and some definitions about different types of bonds. And then notice somewhere in the middle, there are a couple learning objectives that have the word risk in them. So I want you to remember this, that bond investing um, exposes the investor to pretty much two basic types of risk. The first risk is default risk. And that comes under a couple of different names. We'll talk about some of those in this slide deck. But think about it this way. Let's suppose that we buy a bond issued by a large corporation like Johnson & Johnson. And Johnson & Johnson promises to pay us $50 every six months for the next 20 years. And then at the end of 20 years, it will return our par value of the bond. So default risk is the risk essentially that we are either a not going to receive each one of those fifty dollars in a timely manner or that we might receive less than fifty dollars i mean after all johnson and johnson could pick up the phone and call us and say hey we, we owe you 50 we only have 40 will you will you take 40. now that typically doesn't happen with these large corporations but that's all part of default risk and then of course the second part of default risk is that huge one thousand dollar par value payment at maturity so I want you to think about default risk as the uncertainty about receiving both the magnitude and the timing of those promised cash flows. The other type of risk in general is known as interest rate risk. And interest rate risk is very simply uh, uh, encapsulated by the relationship between yields and bonds. If the yield goes up, let's call those interest rates. So if interest rates rise, if yields rise, the price of the bond is going to fall. So if we have to sell the bond before it matures, we may get less than we had hoped for it. That's called interest rate risk and longer term bonds have uh, have greater interest rate risk. So all the risk that we're going to talk about can probably be uh, lumped into one of those two categories. And then we'll talk about uh, maturity, what happens at maturity, and then we'll, we'll dance around the issue of mathematics at the end of this slide deck when we talk about default rates and dollar default rates and expected returns. So let's do a couple of simple things here. Bond trading. You know, I want you to think of uh, what goes on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange where investors, both current shareholders and potential shareholders, they get together and they agree to trade. Well, bond markets are, are no different. I mean, maybe they're a little bit less uh, uh, popular, a little bit, uh, they show up less uh, on news stations, but all we do as bond holders and potential bond holders is we meet someplace. Now, sometimes that place is an organized exchange, like a physical place, but most times in the bond market, it's just, uh, you know, nowadays you just whip out your phone and you press a button and you can either buy or sell a bonds. And so what, uh, what we do, bond trading, is the notion that we can buy low and sell high, just like we wanna do on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. But the bet in the bond market is a little bit different than the bet over on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in that almost everything can be summarized by changes in yield. So notice what we have in that first bullet point, making a profit from changes in interest rates. And so essentially what happens is that if you think interest rates are going to fall, then you buy a bunch of bonds, then when interest rates fall, you can sell them at a higher price. 
you know, every traded bond is ultimately redeemed at its face value. So remember that term, face value, par value, maturity value, principal amount, they all pretty much mean the same thing. And for almost all bonds, that pretty much means $1,000 on the maturity date. So remember this, that these large corporations and even medium-sized corporations, you know, issue bonds in the hundreds of millions and oftentimes in the billions of dollars. So what these companies do is they chop it into more palatable parts, like $1,000, so that you and I can, uh, you and I can buy a bond for $1,000. No offense to your personal wealth situation, but I certainly couldn't lend uh, Johnson & Johnson $100 million uh, or a couple of billion dollars. I mean, of course, J&J &J would love to pick up the phone and call, uh, you know, Elon Musk and say something like, hey, you know, we need $6 billion. Do you have it laying around? And, and he, he might have it laying around, but he might not want to buy a Johnson & Johnson bond. So what happens is these corporations, they appeal to us in the bond market, whether we're individuals or institutions. Now, a couple of terms here that I've mentioned earlier, but let's go ahead and be more specific in a definition. So the bond yield, right? This is the amount of return earned on a bond over its life. Ah, assuming that the bond is held until its maturity. So what do we do? We get lots of coupon payments and we reinvest those. And then we get the principal payment uh, at maturity based on, and that, that yield is going to be based on the price that we paid, that we paid for the bond. Now, there are lots and lots of models out there that try to predict what a yield might be. Uh, but what we have in that bottom block point there is... Uh, is the simplest of all. What we do is say, hey, let's look at a Johnson & Johnson bond. What, what is the yield on that bond? And the answer is something like, well, let's go ahead and start with the risk-free return. You know, the return that is earned on, boy, let me just throw it out there. How about a treasury security that has the identical maturity date as our bond in question? Because, of course, we're just going to start with that risk-free rate, and then we're going to add something to it and we're gonna add a credit spread. Notice what we have down there at the very end of the slide deck, compensation to the buyer for taking on default risk. Now look at that first block point, I said this earlier, inverse relationship, make, this, make sure you know this for the exam. Um, when, uh, when the economy changes, right, where we have an economy that's either expanding or contracting and in expanding economies, you typically have interest rates move in one direction, and, and contracting economies, you typically have interest rates move in the opposite direction. And when those yields move, they're going to cause prices to change. So when yields go up, bond prices go down. And the simplest example I can give you uh, without doing any extensive math is the following. Suppose I come to you and say, hey, I need to borrow $100. I'll pay you $110 next year. And you look at me and you say something like, okay, Jim, let me look at your credit risk, your credit score. And if you agree, if you agree to lend me that $100 today, you're implicitly agreeing to a 10% yield, right? You buy my promise in a piece of paper, let's call it a bond, you buy my promise for 100. And then I fulfill my promise by paying you 110. So there's 110 over 100 minus 1, that gives us 10%. But let's suppose there are some of you way over here on the left who say, you know what, Jim, I'm not really happy about your credit score. Uh, I demand I demand 12% or 13%. Well, the only way you can get 12% out of something that I'm offering, 10% is to pay less for it. So you're going to say, you know what, Jim, I'll buy your bond, but I'm only going to pay $96 or $97. So if I accept that and I continue to make that promise of 110 at maturity, well, then you get your 12 or 14 percent. On the other hand, there might be some of you over here on the right who say, you know what, Jim, we think you're a super guy. We think you make tons and tons of money. We only are going to require 8 percent or 7 percent. Well, then I'm going to say, well, if you only require 7 percent, I'm going to ask you to pay more for the bond. So you might pay me 102 or 103. And so that gives you a really good idea of the rate relationship and why, as yields go up, uh, bond prices go down. So this can be summarized in this little illustration that we have here. Look at the upward sloping, uh, what is that, a yellow-orange kind of a curve there. This is known as the yield curve. So yield curve, we've got 
uh, time to maturity on the horizontal axis and yield to maturity on the vertical axis. And so during expanding economies, yield curves pretty much are upward sloping because investors will demand higher yields the farther out you go for a variety of reasons. Uh, we'll talk about those inside of this slide deck, but also, uh, also in other chapters. What we can do then is we can craft a corporate bond yield curve that's going to lie above that risk-free yield curve and that's going to reflect probably something like i described earlier that's probably going to reflect default risk and this is called a credit spread and so if you know if uh let's just pick some points there where those vertical arrows are if that risk-free rate of interest is let's say five percent uh, the corporate bond yield might be, let's say, 8%. And so that spread would be uh, 3% or 300 basis points. Uh, here's a super simple definitional slide. The bond indenture is really just the legal and binding contract. When, when Johnson & Johnson issues a bond, it, it signs a contract. It says something like, I promise to pay interest and I promise to pay principal to whoever holds this piece of paper. And that piece of paper is called the bond indenture. Now, of course, you know, the bondholders, each bondholder doesn't actually get this piece of paper. You know, it's held, uh, it's held with the SEC and in a trust. And, you know, there are tons of places where you can access it if you, if you are the bondholder. But that's really just the, uh, the legal and binding contract that outlines all, all of the details in the bond, like the coupon rate, the time to maturity, and any other provisions that, that are in the bond. And so, of course, what did I say just a second ago? You know, it might go into a trust. And so the corporate trustee's role, uh, you know, this could be almost anybody out there. I, I could be the corporate trustee. I could be Jim's trustee. And, uh, you know, what my role is, is, to, is, is to protect all the bondholders. We, we, the, the chapter uses the term investors out there. And so we need to make sure that uh, all the terms are followed. We need to make sure that the bondholders are not being taken advantage of, that they don't know something. There's not hit something hidden over there. There's not something hidden over there. And, you know, in a 20-year in a bond, five years from now, the corporation comes by and say, oh, we're going to do something. And the bondholders will say, oh, well, we didn't know about that. And you would come to me, the trustee, and say, hey, Jim, what the heck is going on? And I would have to say something like, well, I'm not too competent because it was right there and I forgot to tell you. You know, so the trustee's responsibility is to uh, act as a good fiduciary, right? And then even though in that indenture, uh, the maturity date of the bond might be listed, of course it will be listed, but there are various ways to, uh, to retire a bond early. And that has to be outlined in there. We'll talk about that here in just a second. So let's get back to this whole thing about default risk. So the question then becomes when, when Johnson & Johnson calls us, and let's suppose that you and I, we're the group of bondholders that are going to lend Johnson & Johnson, you know, four or five or six hundred million dollars. And we don't really have time to investigate Johnson & Johnson's financial statements, its board of directors, estimate cash flows over the life of the bond. Uh, do some kind of a due diligence on each board member. We don't know about the supply chain on that side of the, so we don't know all that stuff and we don't have time. So what do we do? We call the experts and the experts are organizations like Standard and Poor's and Moody's and there are other ones out there. Uh, Fitch is one and Weiss is one. And what they do is that they make it really easy for us. They just assign a grade. And so look in the green, these things are investment graded bonds. So th these are bonds that have a super high probability of not defaulting. In other words, what was I saying earlier? That $50 on the Johnson & Johnson bond for 20 years. So those investment grade bonds, you're pretty likely, highly likely, not 100% though, that's important, not 100% guaranteed, but you're pretty likely to get the $50 on time plus the $1,000. Uh, at maturity. And then notice we have some red there. So, so double B rated bonds or below, these are called speculative graded bonds. Ooh, doesn't that term sound, uh, sound like it's risky? Speculative graded bonds. Some people call them high yield bonds. That's what, the, that's what this chapter does. And that's why we have it in uh, uh, the heading of this slide deck. And they're also called non-investment grade bonds. Uh, 
and so the interesting thing about investing in these non-investment grade bonds is that most of them, the overwhelming majority of them, don't ever don't ever uh, default. However, uh, they have higher probabilities of default, so therefore they they have higher they have higher yields. But notice what we have down there at the bottom, and this is what I was saying in that very first slide. That all right, we're looking at this from the the issuer's perspective, but we're also looking at it from the investor's perspective is that there's a source of excellent returns uh, on those non-investment grade bonds because you can buy them for a cheaper price. Instead of paying 960 per Johnson & Johnson bond, you might be able to pay $800 for a non-investment grade bond. And, and by the way, the reading talks about uh, debt ratios, and those are all super important. But let me give you a quick lesson on how S&P and Moody's and Fitch does this. This is Jim's simple way to grade bonds. What they do is they take a look at the operating cash flows of the firm. And if the operating cash flows of the firm are this big, whatever that number is, then they say, okay, what is the total bond outstanding? And if the total bond outstanding is this big, you know, so they have this much cash and they have, and these are cash flows. So this is annual and this is the bond issue. They say, hey, that's a safe bond. Let's call that a AAA rated bond. However, on the other hand, if, if, the cash flows are, how about if I go together, the cash flows are this big, right? And, and the amount of the debt is this big, well, then the firm is not going to have the cash to pay off the bond. So that sounds like a C uh, or a D rated bond. And by, by the way, D stands for bonds that are in default. You can't get worse than D as a, uh, as a bond. All right, a couple of different types of high yield bonds. Skip down to the fallen angels. And so you can think about the, that there are corporations out there who have bonds that are in the green region who over time meet with some either poor economic conditions or poor internal conditions in which they fall down into the red region. And then of course, there are bonds that are in the red region that can be upgraded into the green region. And so when the green falls down to the red, we call that a, uh, we call that a fallen angel. And that's really, let me go back to my little thing. That's really nothing more than the dynamics of, you know, what happens to the cash flow. You know, the bond issue is pretty much fixed. So it's this big, but if the cash flows are going like this and like this and like this, well, when the cash flows are like this, well, then it's going to be a fallen angel. And when the, uh, when the cash flows are, are wide, that's going to be a rising angel, right? Oops, I went the wrong way. So Oh man, there we go. So let me go back to these story bonds. You know, these are these are interesting kind of animals. Um, this is where the uh, the bond trader has to either figure out what the story is or have the story told to them by maybe a broker or uh, the issuing organization. And so notice a couple of things that, that we have bolded in there to fund a specific venture. They are complicated. They offer an attractive yield. And so the bondholders have to be convinced to go ahead and buy the bond. And by the way, nobody's going to pick up the phone and call you or I and say, hey, Jim, can you lend us $1,000? The story is being told to the pension funds who have, you know, tens, maybe even uh, 30 or 40 or $50 million to invest. And so that story usually, uh, um, usually evolves around the founder of the company or the founder's family or an idea, an entrepreneurial idea that might not attract capital from some other place. And so there's a story that goes behind it that sounds something like, hey, when you hear the story about this, uh, about this, these two people over here, they have this great idea, you know, nobody knows about it. I'll, I'll tell you something uh, that I just read in, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, that scientists have actually taken moon dirt or moon dust and they've actually grown a plant out of moon dust. So how, how about that? That sounds like a story bond, right? Let's suppose I'm Jim and I, I somehow uh, went up to the moon and got some dust and I brought it back and I'm saying, look, I can, dro I can grow the greatest tomato plants in this, uh, in this moon dirt. And uh, when you eat this tomato, not only is it going to replenish your whole, you know, whatever it is uh, when you eat 
uh, something good for yourself. But it's also going to do some other stuff, right? It's going to grow hair on top of your head. It's going to turn your gray hair back to its original color and all that kind of stuff. So you get the sense that uh, there's a story to be told. There's your homework assignment is go, uh, go read about uh, someday we're going to go to the moon and plant tomatoes. And when you're up there, those of you who are really young, when you're 60 and you're up there eating a tomato, you'll say, you know what, that Jim, he, he knew what he was talking about. All right, how about some other unique features? Uh, there can be deferred coupons. So most bonds have a fixed coupon payment. What did I say earlier about that Johnson & Johnson bond? That was $50 every year for 20 years. But Johnson & Johnson, now Johnson & Johnson would have no reason to do this. Smaller companies that are maybe higher risk would say something like, look, we need your money now, but we can't pay you for five years. So there'll be a zero coupon for five years, but then in year five, we'll start paying you a 10% coupon, something like that. Step up bonds, on the other hand, they pay a, a lower coupon, like two or three percent for the first five years. Then they'll step up to four or five percent. And, you know, you can have one step or two steps or you can have 100 steps, really, if you wanted a 100, 100 year bond. But the idea is that that you as the bondholder, you receive a higher coupon rate over the life of the bond. Most most bonds have two or three steps. But I like my idea of a of a 100 step bond. You get uh, you get an extra one basis point every year for a 100 year bond. Uh, payment in kind bonds. These things sound an awful lot like, you know, if you if you bought a Johnson and Johnson payment in kind bond, instead of getting instead of getting a coupon payment in cash, they might send you a case of uh, Johnson and Johnson's baby shampoo. But that that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is that when that coupon payment is due, Johnson and Johnson would just give you another bond or another fraction of a bond. So uh, sooner or later, you'll you'll get cash out of out of these PIK bonds, but you probably won't get cash for uh, some time. And then remember what I said earlier that um, in that bond indenture that the corporation lists its maturity date like like 20 years. And there are ways that the corporation can retire those bonds in 18 or 15 or 10 years. But there are also ways that they can say, you know what, we, we, we faked you out. We're not going to pay you in 20 years. We'll pay you in 22 years or 26 years. So this is called an extendable reset bond. And of course, of course, you, you know, you still get your coupon payments throughout there. All right, let's get back to my first conversation about uh, about default risk. So credit default risk, risk that the bond issuer will not make timely payments, right? Evaluated by the ratings agencies. So that's one part of what I called default risk in that beginning. But now, now we need to worry about credit spread risk because sometimes, you know, what did I say earlier? That risk-free bond yield was 8% and our corporate bond yield was 8%, so 5 and 8, right? So that was a 3%. Well, sometimes that credit spread can widen. Let me just take an extreme example. It could widen to 4% or could it, narrow, it could narrow to 2%. Ah, so this is really important as a measure of default risk. We call this credit spread risk. And just think about Think about that illustration from before where that yield curve on top was either getting closer or farther away from the treasury yield curve. And one way that we measure this is through something called the spread duration, which is going to give us an idea of what happens to the price of the bond if the credit spread widens or narrows. Those can be fairly complex calculations, which uh, we'll address at some other time. Now, event risk is this notion that there's something on the horizon. And I'm guessing you guys are popping right into your brain the most dramatic event risk that we've had. Oh boy, am I going to say during my lifetime? I don't know. September 11th was pretty dramatic, but COVID, that was pretty dramatic too. So an unexpected event will negatively impact the company's financial position. Look, you guys know this. You read the Wall Street Journal. We lived through the New York Stock Exchange crashing around COVID. We've, we've done all that kind of stuff. So you know that an event like that is going to have a negative impact on bond prices and stock prices. Now, of course, this event risk doesn't have to reach that kind of a magnitude. Uh, 
Uh, it can be something as simple as a restructuring of the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Maybe we want to issue a bunch of bonds and then repurchase some of our shares of stock. Changing in capital structure, that could be event risk because the market might not like what we're trying to do. Uh, what other examples do we have listed there? Yeah, the merger and acquisition market. I mean, just think of what happened with, uh, you know, 2022, Elon Musk uh, takes over uh, Twitter, uh, natural disasters, large scale repurchase programs. I mean, you can think of almost anything that goes uh, that goes into a company. I'll, I'll give you uh, I'll give you an example that happened long, long time ago um, when Walt Disney died. Um, when it was uh, when that information was released on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, you would think that the stock price for Walt Disney shares would have fallen, but it rose by nine or ten dollars a share immediately because investors thought that being uh, the founder and a conservative that he was kind of holding back the company. And so the, you know the death of the founding uh, chief executive or some, some, something like that could be could be an event risk. And so how do investors protect themselves against, against event risk? Well, we have this uh, over there, a poison put in the indenture, which gives the right uh, of the bondholder to do something, sell the bonds back to the issuing firm at a predetermined price. I'm guessing that you know all about poison pills from that, uh, from that Twitter and Elon Musk takeover. All right, we've done this before. Straight coupon bonds. So this is what I was saying with uh, with uh, Johnson and Johnson. Coupon rate is usually listed as uh, as an annual rate. So what did I say? Fifty dollars every six months. So that would have been a ten percent coupon rate. Chop that in half. So a bondholder would get fifty dollars every year for for every. Uh, uh, every year until the bond matures twice a year in the U.S. Outside of the U.S., uh, most of these bonds pay interest annually, although there's really nothing interesting about it. It's really just history uh, and convention. So those are those are fixed rate bonds, but there is no reason that firms can't issue bonds that float. So we have these floating rate bonds that are typically tied to a floating rate interest rate, uh, floating rate. Now, historically, that was the London Interbank offered rate, but I'm guessing that you guys are aware that LIBOR was under some kind of scrutiny and there's some kind of uh, some kind of a controversy. And so that LIBOR rate is going to be replaced by the secured overnight financing rate. Some people call that SOFR. And there are a bunch of other uh, rates that are out there. I mean, I could come up with uh, I could come up with Jim's uh, Interbank offered rate. Uh, if you guys believed that I knew what I was talking about. Uh, participating bonds, these are interesting animals because what they do is they allow for higher coupon payments if the firm becomes more profitable. And so these participating bonds, they kind of act like a share of stock, not really, but they kind of, I mean, they still have a maturity value. Uh, in 20 or 40 years. But if the firm increase, what did I say about cash flows, right? If the cash flows keep going like this and this and this, well, then the bondholder can receive more. Uh, income bonds, these things are just like participating bonds. However, uh, they depend on uh, the actual cash flows or income. And so sometimes they could go up, but sometimes they could go down. So remember that difference between the participating bonds, those coupons, they only go up in good times. Income bonds, they could go up. Some could go up, but some could go down as well. Zero coupon bond, that was like the bond I gave you as the example of me borrowing $100 from you at that in my original example. Zero coupon bonds pay no interest which means that they sell for steep, steep discounts. I mean, if you buy a 30 year zero coupon bond, you might only pay $400 for it today. You pay 400 today and then you don't get anything for 30 years and then you get back your $1,000. Now bonds in general can either be secured or tied to an asset or they can be unsecured. So let's go through some of these secured bonds. So a mortgage bond, do you know exactly what this means? This is what you sign when you uh, when you take out a mortgage loan for your house. I mean, it's not really called a mortgage bond, but what do you do? You sign a piece of paper that says something like, 
I give the mortgage banker the right to come in and move into my basement uh, if I don't make the payments. Now, of course, they're not going to move into your basement. They're going to they're going to foreclose, have you move out of the house, and they're going to they're going to sell the asset. And so, mortgage bonds are tied to you know almost anything that, that out there that is considered real property. Uh, collateral trust bonds are just the opposite of physical bonds. These these are. Uh, I'm sorry, physical assets. These are financial assets. So what do we have listed there? Stocks, notes, bonds, similarly ranked securities owned by the issuer. You know, so they throw these financial securities into a trust, right? And so there's there's a trust manager, there's a financial institution in charge of it. And then they issue bonds using all that financial stuff as, uh, as collateral. Uh, ETCs. Uh, these are fascinating because uh, our economy today and throughout history probably wouldn't be operating as efficiently as it is because there are lots of companies that use assets that cost tremendous amounts of money, like an airline industry, like uh, a railroad industry. In fact, these equipment trust certificates, they go all the way back, you know, to the 18... Oh, I don't know. When did we start? When did we start doing? Uh, when did we start doing railroad trains? Um, when did uh, when did Doc and Marty go back in time and Back to the Future Part Three? Anyway, you know these railroad cars they cost huge amounts of money back then, and so what they did is they would say something like, "Look, let's go ahead and have whoever built the railroad car, or these days, you know, like Boeing with airplanes, let's put that asset into a trust." And then uh, an airline or a, a, a railway, they can go ahead and say something like, all right, what we want to do is we'll borrow money and we'll pay. I'm going to put that in quotations. We'll pay for that asset, but you keep it over there and we'll repay the bond. And if we repay the bond and we do it over time, then we'll take possession of that asset. So it's kind of like we're it's kind of like a fancy lease. You know, remember from your accounting days, there are operating leases and financial leases. Well, this is really pretty much just uh, just kind of a lease. Uh, remember, I said that there are secured bonds and then there are unsecured bonds. So here's another definition of an unsecured bond. These are just called uh, debentures in which companies like Johnson and Johnson, they get away with issuing hundreds of millions of dollars in bonds that are debentures because of their capacity to generate cash flows, right? We're all going to wash our hair with Johnson's baby shampoo. So we're all going to go down to Walmart or Target and buy that no matter what, no matter what happens. And then there are senior bonds and then there are junior bonds. The, the, the chapter calls these subordinated bonds. And then there are bonds that have what we call embedded options, convertible debentures. Boy, we can have the right but not the obligation to convert our bond into common stock. And so if the corporation is generating tons and tons of money, right, which means that on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, investors are bidding up the price of that share of common stock, we can take our bond and we can convert it into shares of stock. And so as soon as that bond is converted into equity, then the issuing company then doesn't have to make those coupon payments. All right, there are lots of reasons why companies want to pay their bonds off early. And most of it has to do with exactly the way you and I face our mortgage, right? Um, I always tell my students this and I say, ask your parents what kind of a house they would have uh, they would have bought if they were 25 years old in 1981. Now, of course, I'm getting so old that I have to say to them, ask your grandparents, right? And so in 1981, mortgage interest rates were, I don't know, 16%, 18%. So, you know, because the interest rates were so high, we would have all bought these little teeny houses back then. But then what happens? We have Paul Volcker, who, you know, dramatically changes the face of the, uh, of the Fed and interest rates over the 1980s decade. And then through the 1990s, interest rates came down. So what did we all do? We refinanced our mortgage. And so this is what happens here. Corporations, they, of course, want to refinance their mortgage. And that's what's happening here. So when interest rates fall, what they're going to do is they're going to issue a bond at the lower coupon rate and then take the proceeds and pay off all the uh, 
all the old bond holders. So that's the first and most primary reason why corporations would retire early. Now, the other second reason is to change the capital structure of the firm. Maybe, maybe the firm is over leveraged or under leveraged and they want to change the debt to equity ratio. And so they retire some bonds early. This all goes back to firms trying to find an optimal capital structure. So that's important. And now the reading says something like to increase shareholder value. But if you take b uh, block point one and block point two, both of those activities are going to increase shareholder value. And then, uh, Inside of the debenture, there are, I'm sorry, inside of the bond indenture, there are terms that say something like, look, you're not allowed to pay a dividend unless you pay all these coupon payments for five years. So these are highly restrictive. And so corporations just say something like, you know what, we're doing better than we were when we issued the bond. Let's just retire these bonds so we don't have to worry about all those restrictive conditions. Ah, some bonds are callable. So here's another example of an embedded option. This gives the bondholder, uh, I'm sorry, this gives the issuing firm the right, but not the obligation to force the bondholders to sell them back when interest rates fall. Two types here, there's a fixed price call. What this means is that uh, when interest rates fall, um, the issuing corporation will say, we're calling these bonds, by the way, we owe you just $1,000, so we're going to pay you that $1,000. That's part of the bond indenture. And then as a favor, we'll pay you the next coupon payment, right? So that's called a fixed price call. And by the way, the bondholders, they know about this when, when they buy the bond. Now, think about how the bondholders are getting slighted during this transaction. If, if the coupon rate, think about this, coupon rate was 18%, like in my 1981 example, and, and interest rates now are down to 8%. So what can the company do? I mean, it can lop off a huge uh, interest expense, coupon payments every year. So if interest rates, if yields fall from 18 down to eight, that bond price is gonna soar. I mean, it might go up to $1,200 or $1,300. But under a fixed price call, the bondholders, they only get what's promised to them, the $1,000. But in a make whole call provision, the, the issuing firm pays that $1,200 or $1,300. Um, you know, as I've gone through and done research and read about bonds over the years, I've seen tons and tons of these uh, fixed callable bonds, just only a handful of these uh, make whole callable bonds. Sinking fund provision, I teach this to my students all the time. This is nothing more than a savings account. Um, so what happens is that the, the sinking fund provision in its simplest case requires an annuity paid into a sinking fund, you know, a trust fund that's being managed by a financial institution. And so the corporation saves regularly so that there's enough money in there to repay the bond. Um, Sometimes there's lots of money going into that sinking fund. Sometimes there's zero dollars going into that sinking fund. But look at the second block point. The terms of the provision are clearly outlined in the indenture. And so when that fund gets to, you know, so there we go. We have an example there in the circle point. You know, suppose uh, 60 million, 20 years to maturity. And what they want to do is the sinking fund says, you know what, instead of waiting, until you're 20 to pay out the $60 million. What we're going to do is we're going to chop that 60 into four parts. So 15 million and 15 million and 15 million and 15 million. And we'll just do this over time. And so that provision allows for the early retirement of some of those bonds. And by the way, when you buy the bond, you'll know, you'll know if your bond is going to be re retired in 20 years or 16 years or 18 years. And uh, most of these sinking fund provisions, they, they pretty much get carried out. Uh, there are times when the company will say something like, hey, we were going to, you know, we were going to retire your bond here in year 18, but will you hold on for two more years? We'll just, we'll keep paying you coupon payments, something like that. Uh, maintenance and replacement funds. So think about, uh, think about this. Here's the example that I give my students all the time. Um, we have collateral. 
Sometimes that collateral can be the actual physical asset that we buy, some, like a building or a, a piece of machinery or technology. Sometimes it could be a share of stock or a bond. Uh, but if it's a building and we have an event that, you know, uh, an earthquake or something, you know, we might have to repair it. <laughs> um, we might have to maintain it. And so the example that I give my students, it comes from, you know, one of my all time favorite movies in the old days, Pink Panther. And then my children love to watch the Steve Martin Pink Panther movies. These are I mean, these are such fun to watch. They're so silly. But if you have the Pink Panther diamond as the collateral for a bond issue, you probably don't need a maintenance, maintenance and replacement fund because, you know, what did we learn from James Bond and diamonds are forever? It's the hardest substance on the planet. However, you know, if you have a castle that's built on the ocean and it's made out of sand, well, then you probably need a maintenance and replacement fund. And then you can always sell some of your assets to uh, to redeem the bond. Now, another thing that happens in the stock market all the time is that, you know, companies can make a tender offer for their own shares. That's called a self tender offer, or they can make a tender offer for a target firm shares. This is what happened with uh, with Twitter. But it's not limited to just the stock market. And so what can happen is that the executives can say something like, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Bondholder, we know you own these bonds. Uh, we know there is a million of them out there. We would like to buy, you know, uh, 200,000 of them at a price of $1,000 and $1,012. And we're going to do that over the next two months or three months or some time period. So a tender offer for for those shares. So as a bondholder, you get to pick. Do you want to sell your bonds back to the company or do you want to hold on to them and keep receiving your interest and then your final principal payment? Now, here's where we get to the end of the slide deck where we kind of dance around a little bit of mathematics. So this is entirely from the bondholder's perspective. All right, so recovery rate. So let's suppose that we have an event and the company defaults. Well, if the company defaults and it used the Pink Panther Diamond as collateral, well, that Pink Panther Diamond probably is going to be enough to recover 100%. But if it's the sandcastle built on the right on the ocean, well, it's probably going to recover 0%. So what we need to do is we need to figure out what is going to be our loss given default. So what happens? We're, we're owed $1,000, right, from the issuing company. Well, if there's some collateral, then the company says, look, we don't have your $1,000. We're going to default. Here are our assets. And so we take possession of the assets as the bondholder and we sell and we sell the asset. Well, if we sell it for $600, then our loss is only $400. So that's the loss given default. Now with the Pink Panther Diamond, I'm not really, I mean, this is of course a made up thing, but I'm not quite sure how that works. We probably would, we would probably get money. We probably generate a profit if we, if we had that as, uh, as, as our collateral. So the recovery rate then is one minus the loss given default. And then that, uh, that default rate, that is the percentage of all outstanding loans that a lender has written off, right? As after a prolonged period of missed payments. Uh, I'm hoping that you guys read the Wall Street Journal every day. I tell my students all the time, this is what you should be doing. And you should especially pay attention to the editorial page. I say this regularly in these recordings. I'm probably repeating myself, but the uh, Wall Street Journal editors have a tremendous sense of humor. I laugh once or twice a week, but they really are uh, on target with their assessment of the economy. So you're probably reading about student loan default rates here in 2022. All right, two ways to do this issuer default rate and dollar default rate. And you can see those ratios with uh, numbers in both the numerator and the de denominator for issuer default rates and then uh, par values uh, of dollars uh, under dollar default rate. So let's go ahead and do this final one here, expected return on the bond. So what are we doing? We're going to start with that risk free rate. We did that on that very first slide or so. Then we're going to add a credit spread. And remember, that credit spread for Johnson & Johnson was what, 3%? But if, but if it's Jim's company, right, and I'm just Jim and I make, you know, whatever I make, and I'm a teeny company, my, my credit spread 
what would I say, Johnson & Johnson was 3%, mine might be 8% or 9%. So we're gonna take the risk-free rate, add that credit spread, and then we're gonna take out, we're gonna take out this loss, uh, this expected loss rate, which we can get from what we talked about on those previous slides. So probability of defaults times one minus the expected recovery rate. Now, these calculations can get slightly complex, but this LOS just asks you to explain it. And so I think you have a really good sense here. Expected return, treasuries or risk-free rate, plus a default credit spread, and then that uh, expected loss rate. So there's what happens when we have this credit spread, right? And that's in the green, there's that upward sloping. Now, this is just a little bit of a curve than what we had before. So here, as we move along the horizontal axis, we're doing declining credit quality. So we're going from you know the AAA all the way down to D. And so of course that credit spread should be upward sloping. And then that excess credit spread is going to also be upward sloping but then it's going to be uh, it's going to be higher as we move into those uh, what do we call those the red bonds the high yield bonds and that takes us through our learning objectives um, so let me go ahead and just remind you what I think are most important things in here. So the definitions of the bonds, so those first handful, and then the risk part stuff in there, that's important. And then all of the different types and classes of bonds. And don't forget that as a test creator, I would always ask one simple question about, you know, maybe a fixed rate coupon bond that doesn't have any embedded options, I'd ask one question. And then I'd ask one or two questions with uh, a callable bond or a convertible bond or any kind of a bond that has an embedded option. Those are the more interesting questions. So thank you for watching and good luck studying.